This morning we are continuing to talk about prayer from Matthew chapter 6. We've uh, had two messages on this uh, subject, a subject which is of utmost importance because prayer is communion with God. Prayer is to be a two-way fellowship. Too often, prayer in people's minds is just complaining to God or telling God, but not listening to what God is saying back to you. Correct? And of course, in weeks to come, we're going to talk about how God does communicate with you. (laughs) How, How do you hear from God? These are important subjects and subjects that every Christian should be familiar with. So let's bow in prayer and ask God to help us this morning. Father, you are the God of truth. We can depend upon one thing with you, that if you say it, it is the truth. And it is absolute truth. It's not relative. It's not uh, susceptible to men's interpretation of it. It is absolute truth. That's why I'm so glad that you gave the commandments. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. These are simple concepts that any even a child can understand. And so we love you this morning. We ask that your spirit, the Holy Spirit sent in the place of our Lord and Savior Jesus will be our guide into all truth. We would open our hearts and minds as has already been prayed that we may grasp and apply these principles in our lives every day. And we'll be careful to praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. From Matthew chapter 6, we will not read uh, the entire passage, but we will start with verse 9, which is an answer to the question the disciples ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Now that is not included in this passage, but in another passage, the disciples asked the Lord, teach us to pray. In response to that, Jesus starts in verse 9, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We've already covered that verse. We are to pray to the Father, recognizing that he is holy. Our Sunday school lesson this morning dealt with the justice of God. Certainly, If God is holy, he must be just. That is, he must treat men the same or be impartial in his evaluation of their their moral character, their motive and their moral character, correct? He cannot treat a sinner as a saint or a saint as a sinner and call himself just. This is one of the prophecies that is in the book of Isaiah that is repeated many times. Woe unto him who calls good evil and evil good. We live in a society today where men call evil good and good evil. But our God is just and holy and he will not connive with evil. He's going to call evil evil and good good. Then Jesus prays, uh, teaches his disciples in verse 10 to pray thus, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We said last week that uh, God's will is being done perfectly in heaven. <laughs> no arguments in heaven. And our prayer is to be, and we discussed what the kingdom of God is, Anybody remember the, what the kingdom of God is? Well, that's he's quoting scripture, right? For the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But we said that the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of Christ or of God in the hearts of men. So the kingdom of God is within you, the Bible says. It is not an external kingdom made of mortar and brick, but it is a voluntary submission and happy servitude to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we become God's servants or His property, if you will. We belong to God. Paul Peter says it this way, He are bought with a price. Praise God. 
We are bought with a price. Jesus purchased us, if you will, with His own blood. He died on Calvary's cross to make atonement for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Not just for the elect. Remember I shared with you about the difference between a particular Baptist and the general Baptist. Particular Baptists say Jesus' death was only for the elect. The general Baptist Jesus said Jesus' death was for the whole world. So we are to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thus, when we pray, we recognize that God's will is being done in our lives. That is, we have voluntarily submitted and are serving God from a happy and joyful disposition. We love serving God, right? Amen. And it doesn't make any difference if you're cooking pizzas, cleaning toilets, or preaching on a street corner. If you're a Christian, you are serving God. Sure. You young people, if you're mowing the grass, you little kitties, if you're cleaning up the house for mommy, you are serving God from a pure right heart. That's why you do it happily. Whatever your hand, find it to do, do it with all your might, even if it's hip hiccuping. <laughs> We're to do it. That's involuntary, by the way. Her hiccups are involuntary. Right? Now, if she started cursing, I'd have to rebuke her because that's voluntary. But she's just hip hiccuping. She can't help that. There's a difference between involuntary and voluntary. Correct? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. <clears throat> now, the next verse, verse 11, we'll begin here today. This is a very important principle in the life of the Christian. Give us this day... Our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The Bible says in many places, each day, take no thought for tomorrow, what ye shall eat or drink, for each day has enough trouble of its own. In other words, worry and be concerned about nothing relative to this world's needs or our physical needs. We should not be consumed. We should not have our minds and our hearts consumed with what we're going to eat, how we're going to be sustained. By the way, people that live that way are called gluttons, aren't they? They're, they get up in the morning, and the only thing they're worried about is what they're going to eat for that day. Now, folks, if we lived in medieval times, where all you might have would be a root from a tree that for supper you might wake up hungry, and that might be a very big concern for your, for your day, right? But in this land of plenty and abundance, we certainly should not be consumed with what we're going to eat or what we're going to drink. We are to, as Christians, if we are praying properly, we are asking our Father to care for us this day. Now, we realize in this earth, eating... Food is necessary to life. Isn't that correct? Food is a, it is a necessity for us to continue to live. So therefore, it's not just an option. Uh, I think about as long as Jesus went, what, 40 days and 40 nights without eating? That's probably about the, the outer edge of not eating. You, because he would have died. Remember it says, and he was a hungered at the end of that period. So therefore, he... The angels brought food and ministered to him after he was tempted. But we food is a necessary part of life. So the Jesus is trying to teach that the food is not is what important, but the life is what is important. So therefore, we pray to God, give us this day our daily bread. Father, sustain our lives today physically. We want God created us to live upon this earth, to enjoy all the beauty of this earth. That's the reason He created man. That we might praise and honor and worship Him. We might look. I, I, I was sharing something with Brother Jed last night. In the restaurant business, as in life, by the way, this is a principle of life, we enjoy having people tell us that something we did or said is good. Whether it's food, my sister, uh, or, or a, a decoration. My sister has made a beautiful decorations we put up on our counter. Some of you ladies have seen them. 
men don't appreciate these things, but ladies appreciate these things. So today, yesterday she brought a beautiful fall decoration with lights and we plugged it in. It was it's just so maybe it was Friday she brought it. Friday she brought it. It was so beautiful. And we all said, Oh man, that is so beautiful. And I know how she felt. Because when people say to me, Oh, your pizza is so great, it's just like you know, they did something wonderful. I, and I tell people, you don't know how much that means to me to have you tell me how much, how good it is. Brother Jed said he heard a woman in the restaurant say, this sauce is so good I could drink it. He put that on his Facebook. That he heard a woman in the restaurant say, this sauce is so good I could drink it. I, I, that just gives me a, such a wonderful, warm sense of enjoyment and fulfillment. Think of how God feels when you tell God, how great you are, God. How wonderful your creation is. Do you think God doesn't swell with pride? Do you, listen, I want you to know something that God, this is a ministry to God. That's why Paul says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. When you give thanks to God, it's, there's something that swells up inside of God. It's a point of ministering to God. You understand this? You and I minister to God by telling Him how wonderful His creation is. How great His works are. You know, the Psalms everywhere talk about, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Why? Because it blesses God. And if you love somebody, you want to bless them. Don't you? <laughs> Every parent understands this. We look at that little baby fresh from mommy's womb. And we clean them all. The first thing we do is clean them all up. They try to fluff up what little bit of hair. You girls might have had some more hair. Usually a bald is a cue ball. Fluff up that little hair. Sometimes they'll put a little bow in that little baby's hair. And here's this sweet little innocent, helpless little child. And dad, he may be the biggest tough guy in the world. He's just a bowl of jello. First time he sees that little baby. God wants us to depend upon him because He's the great provider. And when we ask Him to and recognize that He's the sustainer of our lives and ask Him to provide for us, He loves it. It's a blessing to Him. You know, one of the problems with raising kids is they go from saying, Mommy, can I have a peanut butter sandwich? To saying, Don't worry about it, Mom. I'll just get a pizza down there. And parents begin to feel useless. <laughs> Bill and uh, Linda haven't gone through that yet, but Paul and I have. We remember when all our kids were gone. John was gone and married. Hannah was away at college, and we're just in the house looking at each other like nobody needs anything. Are we even needed anymore? That's a true feeling, by the way, for parents. They feel useless all of a sudden. They go from being required for life, right? Parents are necessary, or a parent type is necessary for life for a child. Children cannot live without parental involvement. That's why God designed the family. They go from that to being, nobody calls, nobody comes. I don't have to make peanut butter sandwiches for anybody. Listen, God is our great Father. And He loves to provide for us. And our prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is a blessing to our Father. He never tires of caring for his children. Do you understand this principle? Our prayers are as much for us as they are for him. Sometimes we think, oh, it's me, 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 me. But listen, if you pray them sincerely, our Father loves us asking. Actually, God commands us to come to the throne of grace, doesn't he? Commands us to come and pray. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. These are not optional. These are commands. These are, you understand the sentence, seek, ask. These are commands. Do it. Because our Father derives blessing from us asking, give us this day our daily bread. Now, does that mean we just, we just sit and do nothing? No, not necessarily. 
Now, some people are not physically able to do things, but if you're able to work, you get up and go to work. But you still live by faith. Every Christian lives by faith. That's the only way Christians can live and be called a Christian. You live by faith. There have been many stories down through the years where God has miraculously provided food for people. There's a man named George Mueller. How many of you ever heard of George Mueller? George Mueller was an Englishman. He started an orphanage. And he literally would pray food in for his orphans. And they'd sit down to eat. Sometimes there wouldn't be a stick of bread in the house. And they'd pray and somebody would knock on the door by the time the prayer was over and food would be brought for those orphans. There's a book called Mimosa, M-I-M-O-S-A, Mimosa. It's written by a missionary to India by the name of Amy Carmichael. And Amy Carmichael met this little Indian girl who was a child bride. Back, by the way, in India, many times the older men, even 35 or 40, will marry a 12-year-old girl. There's a child bride. And they have children by these girls. And um, this girl had been a child bride. Her parents arranged it, probably got some money for it. She married this man. He was cruel mean and she had two boys by him and then he disappeared so left her with these two boys in India and uh, she didn't she never heard Christianity she didn't know the name of God she just uh, knew there was a God she believed him and uh, attached to their little home was a granary a granary is a little building uh, built just to put corn or wheat the grain in it so she, Mimosa would go back in this grain, she would kneel down and she would take her long, part of her long dress and she would hold it and she would say, she called him Father. Now Father, we need food. And she would kneel and pray. And for two years God fed Mimosa and her two little boys. And then she met Amy Carmichael one day and Amy Carmichael shared the gospel with Mimosa and she said, well I know this God you speak of, I just didn't know his name, but he's been taking care of me for two years. So you see, God does actually practically provide, give us this day our daily bread for those who either have not the means or uh, otherwise, but those of us who work, we still nonetheless live by faith. We, 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 we work hard knowing that God is the provider of everything, isn't he? Every resource, the very breath that we breathe every day comes from God. We can, none of us can beat our chest and, and pluck at our suspenders and say, we've done this without God, can we? Absolutely impossible. So our attitude in prayer is total dependence upon the love and the grace of God. Isn't that right? For even the most practical things in life, the most basic things in life are food. You know, it's very similar to children who have to eat every day. Children don't go to bed at night. I don't think any of them. Christine, you didn't do this when you went to bed, did you? And well, I think, well, let's see now. This is uh, June, and I wonder if we're going to have enough food for September. You never did that, Christine. You don't even do that now, do you? Yeah, Christine? Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. I've been calling you Christine for a long time. Sarah, you don't do that, do you, Sarah? You don't go to bed and think, hmm. I wonder, let's see, uh, how many gallons of milk were in there? Now, you might look at the milk at night because you had a bowl of cereal before you went to bed. But you don't, you don't think, mm, I wonder if, yeah, let's, how much money's in the checking account. I wonder if Dad's going to be able to go to the store and buy food. No, they don't. They just go to bed at night. <laughs> Get up in the morning, hey, Mom, I had no milk in the fridge. I need a bowl of cereal. Isn't that right, Linda? Linda, that's what happened. Total dependence on their parents. Hey, folks, that's the way we're to have. The attitude is to be toward God. We depend upon God. Bill and Linda's children know their parents. They trust their parents. Now, as you get older, Andrew may be concerned, Dad, you're making enough money. Boy, there's a lot of kids in this family. Can I, uh, can I put some of my paycheck toward the groceries of the house? You do. That's what you're, you're thinking that way already, aren't you, Andrew? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that way. Oh, oh, Bill, 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 your dad's thinking that way. Okay. I thought Andrew, Andrew, I thought Andrew had this really look like, oh, yeah, I'm really concerned about my dad having enough money to buy the groceries. <laughs> hey, the Bible says our father has unlimited resources. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. Our father, it wants to take care of us. He loves to do it. 
And as we pray, that must be the attitude with which we approach our Father in heaven. Verse 12. Very critical concept in prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I think is in Luke or one of the other translations. The principle's the same. We must be as forgiving as our Father. <laughs> and this prayer... This line in this prayer is a reminder to us that every time we pray that God has forgiven us, graciously forgiven us. And that if during that day someone unjustly mistreats us or cheats us, once a while my wife will come back and say, well, he got a pop and didn't pay for it. I said, don't worry about it. You know, there are people that have said, oh, well, I remember that guy. He got a pop and didn't pay for it. <laughs> the other day, a guy came in. Oh, it was about three weeks ago. A guy came in and couldn't pay his tab. So John just said, ah, give me the money you got. We'll just stick it here in the drawer and you can come back and pay me. I thought, oh, I'll probably never see that guy again. But this last week, he came in and paid his $6 tab and bought some more pizza. So, but the attitude is you want to have an attitude of forgiveness. That should be the overriding attitude that Christians have because our Father is forgiving toward us. So as you pray and you're, you're talking to God, if anyone has done anything against you, you should have a heart of forgiveness. Because remember, God forgives because if God doesn't forgive, then He's going to get bitter. <laughs> and bitterness... It ruins you. The other person doesn't even know you haven't forgiven them, but it ruins, destroys you. God's not going to destroy his life by being bitter and angry at anybody for anything. He's going to be forgiving. So, as we pray, our overriding attitude is forgiveness. And of course, our... Our lesson this morning, science school lesson this morning, pointed out this verse of scripture in Romans chapter 5, and Rome, at the end of Romans chapter 5, and the beginning of Romans chapter 6, where Paul says, basically, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, may it never be. So one of the things about get, receiving forgiveness is that you forsake whatever it is you got forgiveness for, that you do not do it again. This is one of the problems in evangelical Christianity today. We have this idea that we, we're all sinners. We keep sinning. It's, uh, to stop sinning is impossible. And therefore, we have a... It's kind of like a revolving charge card. Of, it's, it's got forgiveness on the front. It's got your name. So every time you sin, you just run the revolving charge card through the credit card machine and God forgives your sin. Folks, that is not true. We are to forsake our sins. If you sin, we have an advocate. Not when, if. Sin is to be, it's really to never happen, but if it does, you go to God for forgiveness with a right heart and with a complete attitude of revulsion and dis the abhorrence and despising that thing that you have done. That's one of the reasons the Bible says publicly confess your sins. So everybody will know you did it, and then you'll be less tempted to do it again. <laughs> right? You'll be humiliated. You'll be ashamed and embarrassed that people know what you did. And of course the purpose is so you won't do it again. Isn't that right? Why do parents, you know, I remember as a kid I took a pack of gum or something from a local grocery store. My mother marched me right back up that grocery store and found the manager and I had to tell him with the, with the trembling lip and what was left of the gum that I had stolen the gum from the grocery store. Why? Because my mother wanted me to remember how humiliating and embarrassing and ashamed I was, so I would never do it 
again. I don't know how many times my mother ended her rebuke of my disobedience with these words, don't ever do it again. Did your mother ever tell you that? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, my mother used to say, oh, don't ever do that again. And yet we've got preachers today who act like God is saying, I forgive you, go ahead out and do it again. Just the opposite of what every good parent tells their child. Isn't that right? So in this prayer this morning, that Jesus, this pattern that we have, Jesus is teaching us that we are to be as forgiving as God. Remember Jesus, uh, Peter said, well, how many times do I forgive? Jesus said 70 times 7. In other words, you should always have an attitude of forgiveness. And this attitude of forgiveness means you cease from the behavior. You do not do it again. This is critical. This is important for us to understand. Of course, many people think that by repeating this little prayer, forgive us our trespasses, we forget, that they're, they're absolving themselves of whatever sins they've committed since the last time they said this prayer. In that way, most people look at this. They repeat it as a mantra. You know what a mantra is? It's like a, it's a saying you say over and over and over again, believing that the saying somehow has power. Some people think that by saying the Lord's Prayer, there's some kind of absolving or cleansing or purifying effect by repeating verbatim the Lord's Prayer. Not so. I told you this. This is a pattern. It is something that we are to use as a model in our personal prayer life. Okay? And when we think of forgiving our uh, those who have sinned against us or forgetting our, uh, our enemies, or people that hate us, we remember that we are to be like God. We are to be like Him. Everybody understand this? Uh -huh. Now, we're never going to be God, but we are to be like Him in our character. We're to be like Him in our motive. We're to be holy. And our character is to be like Jesus. We're to be truthful, honest, practical, down to earth. Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't some philosopher. He was a very practical man. He spoke directly to issues, issues of sin, issues of righteousness. And I'm going to read verse 13, but then next week I'm going to spend time because this is an important verse for us to understand what Jesus meant. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And of course, uh, I have parentheses around this. And some, some of the earlier manuscripts don't include that. But this verse they do include. Do not lead us into temp temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we're going to look at James chapter 2, chapter 1, in regard to this passage of Scripture, when we uh, this particular thing. I want to close by saying this this morning. God is not the author of sin in this world. The entrance of sin into the world was unplanned. It was, un, it was not desired. It was, it was anticipated. God did have wisdom and realize it was possible for man to sin. But never in God's wildest imagination did he think Adam and Eve would actually rebel against him. You know what the proof of that is? What's the proof, somebody? That it, not in God's wildest imagination did God ever believe that Adam and Eve would sin. What's the proof? She ate the apple. No. Nope. Somebody else? Well, what's the proof that God didn't think they'd sin? When he went in? What? Yes, and what have you done? Well, in the garden, he says, Who told you? There's the great proof. It didn't even, when God walked into the garden and Adam and Eve weren't there, the first thought that entered, and then they came out and said, Well, we were naked and hid. His first thought wasn't, You sinned. His first thought was, Who told you? That's a great, to me, that's the greatest proof that God did not know or plan that they should sin. Now, he, he anticipated that they might. He knew it was a possibility. So we're going to discuss this part of the prayer 
next week at length uh, looking at James chapter 1 because I want you to understand something. God never connives with sin. God never is in concert with any man's sin. God is doing everything possible to stop men from sinning. If you do not believe that, I don't believe you can have great faith in God if you don't believe that God is doing everything in His power. And I mean this literally. He's doing everything in His power to stop men from sinning. Well, who do you think Jesus means when He says, do not lead us into temptation? What does He mean? Well, we have to read, the, we'll get into that next week. Okay. We'll, have to, we'll read James chapter 1 and find out what uh, Jesus, James' brother. See, he's remember. He's talking to God. At, well, he's, he's talking to His disciples and He's saying, this is how you pray. Right. So we'll, we'll look at what the... Remember, the Bible is its own best interpreter. If you don't understand or something's not clear, keep reading. Jesus' brother, James, I believe, writes specifically to address probably some misunderstandings about this little prayer, even in the early church. Remember, folks, the people that lived 2,000 years ago were people just like us. They're people. They... They read the Bible the way they wanted to read it, many of them, and they interpreted it the way they wanted to interpret it, just like we have people today. There was all kinds of, even in the early church, there was problems that arose that they had to deal with. Paul, Judea, I mean, Paul had to deal with the problem of circumcision among the church. Barely 70 years after the Lord's gone, they had a problem. So let's not be naive and think that, oh, everybody just went along. No, 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 no. The, the, the Bible is written to correct many of these issues that arose in the church, and so we can find instruction from those things in our own lives, right? Well, Father, we're grateful this morning for the Word of God. We're thankful for the words of our Lord, and we're very grateful for the Holy Spirit who reveals to us the meanings of these things that sometimes can be not difficult to understand but they they're by our misconceptions and by improper doctrine they can be twisted around in our minds and we we believe something that affects what we read in the scripture so we pray lord this week as we contemplate these words lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil that we will uh, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us grasp the meaning of this part of uh, our Lord's instruction. And in all these things we'll be grateful, for we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.